Um, thanks a lot for having us today and this opportunity. I think we're always looking for opportunities to touch base with our user groups um, for all of these resources and really uh, looking for feedback on how we can better address your needs um, and, of course, also making sure things are, are clear about how to best use these resources. Um, so I think we've We've tried to leave uh, ample time for for Q and A at the end. So um, uh, actually, I think we'll we'll do a trade off and maybe have two Q and A sessions or um, kind of work it that way. Um, so I've been uh, I joined RefSeq about 12 years ago. Um, I was originally a curator as part of the group, and I took over as lead on the group um, about coming up on two years ago now. And um, so what I want to do today is I'm going to give uh, a bit of a framework on uh, what RefSeq is, um, kind of the, the nuances of part of the project. I'm also going to go through our gene resource, because uh, really RefSeq and gene are, are uh, yin and yang products, um, and give you a sense of, of where we are with, um, with our human genome annotation. So RefSeq started about 20 years ago. Really the goal here is connecting users with the data that they need. Um, emphasis here is really on, on producing a well-annotated, high-value, uh, low-noise um, set of data. RefSeq itself has a very wide taxonomic scope for a very large uh, set of purposes, including yours, both for you know, understanding clinical reporting, uh, mutation, uh, and also broader uh, views of both um, um, understanding individual genes and whole genomes and comparative analyses across genomes and lots of other uses. Uh, RefSeq itself uh, spans many products. Our, our key product really is, is human, both the human genome annotation and the transcripts and proteins uh, that go with it. Um, but we also have a lot of coverage in, in other eukaryotes, a uh, big emphasis on prokaryotes and other areas, but I'll obviously just talk about human today. Um, RefSeq, I suspect pretty much everybody on the phone is, is familiar with in terms of, of RefSeq is really about sets of, of nucleotide and protein sequence records. Uh, RefSeqs are generated by both automated and manual processes, which I'll get into. And really what, what we try to accomplish with RefSeq is to integrate um, sequence and other information like nomenclature and functional information. And, and partially we think of, of RefSeq as, as serving the role of a review article for sequence to try and integrate everything into, um, into one um, one resource. Uh, you can recognize RefSeqs, uh, which are integrated throughout NCBI resources, but you can recognize them by this distinct underscore in the accessions, and uh, the prefix has uh, different meanings. So, so NM and XMs are mRNAs, and um, Rs for other RNAs, and Ps for proteins, and yeah various succession spaces that we use for, for genomic. RefSeq itself, the sequence information is inherently from INSDC, uh, but the annotation is something that we're producing um, here at NCBI, and the records are owned by NCBI, so, so we can update all of this information um, whenever we want as, as circumstances arise. So, the human data set can be broken down into a few parts. Um, the one you're probably most familiar with is the set of transcripts and proteins that, that we refer to as the known set. These are recognized by the, the NM and NP accession prefixes, and NRs for non-coding RNAs. The emphasis here within the known data set is, is that these are all RNAs that we think exist in the cell. Uh, we are only annotating full-length transcripts, at least full-length 
CDS and preferably also UTRs. They're typically supported by long um, uh, INSTC or, or uh, now PacBio uh, type sequencing that's representing that we, we think we fully understand that this RNA exists in the cell. Uh, we are loosening this up a little bit in cases where, where genes are more complex and we need to, uh, um, to do a bit more interpretation of the available data. Uh, the, the known set for human is completely manually curated. And, uh, and also note that the, the known transcripts are not constrained to match the genome sequence. And I'll provide some stats on that a little bit later. Uh, within the Entree resource, uh, a RedSeq record and a flat file view you know, looks like this. You've probably seen these records. I just want to point out a few uh, features here. Uh, the comment here, here it says reviewed. Uh, the other common term is validated. Both of these mean that this, this sequence has been, uh, has been curated by RevSeq staff. Uh, we also, for a number of records, we provide summaries about what the gene does. And also of interest is uh, many RevSeqs have um, additional attributes down here. Um, here there's an attribute saying uh, this RevSeq is supported for, for all of the exons in this particular combination are, are supported by um, this particular line of evidence. Uh, so we're, we're pr providing that evidence attribution. Um, and then there's also some information on, um, on at least we report Two, there may be other um, samples of RNA-seq data that are supporting all the individual introns found in this particular transcript. Uh, if, if you use the graphical view, you can get um, an idea of the features that are annotated on here. We have mechanisms that, um, that either are annotating features on the protein, so these are, uh, are domains on the protein. Um, annotated either by our, our CDD uh, program here um, or projected from the, the Swiss Prot records. We annotate exon features in terms of how this transcript aligns to the genome. Uh, SNPs are available on the, uh, on the transcript that can be viewed here in this graphical view. And of course, there's SNPs everywhere, so this is very, very dense. There's a subset that you can look at that are um, higher frequency. and Sometimes there may be other features that are annotated on this the sequence record that may be of, of interest in, in interpreting um, in all of this. So if you're interested in, you know, you have, a, you have a SNP at a particular location, looking at it in this, this view is a way to see how it relates to uh, features on the protein, um, how it relates to specific exons, and, and sometimes other features. Uh, we have a growing number of RevSeq. Some genes are very complex. This is an anchored 2 gene with 50 some odd um, transcript variants, lots of alternative promoters, lots of alternative splicing. Um, this is obviously a very complex view that we're, we're trying to provide resources to, uh, to help people slice into this about what's the, the most important data to look at. And I'll touch on that in a minute. Uh, we also have a set of, of uh, what we refer to as model RevSeqs. These are um, represented by the X prefix. Um, these are computational. These have not been hand curated. Uh, they are completely evidence-based. Uh, they're based on both conventional and next-generation sequencing, both short and long read data. We have extensive um, code that we've developed over many years to, to try and uh, represent uh, what we think is the most valuable um, set of information available and the additional data that maybe can't be represented yet in the known set, but um, we think it's worth representing. Um, we do extend uh, partial data to represent full-length models. So a gene like um, ACAT1, where we only have uh, one known RefSeq, uh, but computationally we produced another um, um, eight models 
representing a variety of alternative splicing, um, skipped exon here. And so what's valuable about the X is that you should keep in mind from a clinical perspective, um, obviously it's, it's typically main focus is to look at the known ref seeks. Um, but if you do have a, uh, have a SNP that you need, need to in interpret and you're only seeing it on models and not on known ref seeks, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, that it's completely benign. It's, it's worth considering um, uh, how the, the SNP might be interpreted in those. And, and if you need more information about you know, how much confidence should I put in this model, feel free to, to contact us and I'll show you how to do that a little later. Um, I mentioned that uh, RefSeqs don't have to match the genome. Uh, there's a few ways to recognize RefSeqs that don't match the genome. You, you can't see it on the, the transcript records themselves uh, because the transcript is fine. It's, it, that's what we're asserting is there's some sequence difference of interest versus the genome. Uh, within our graphical viewer, the thing to watch out for is when features are highlighted in gray. And if you mouse over the feature, uh, you can see a comment like this. The rest of the transcript has one frame shift compared to the genome. This is ABO, which has a famous frame shifting indel uh, in the last exon um, that's not uh, quite properly represented in the, uh, the GRCH38 chromosome sequence. Uh, if you look at the, the genome annotation as a flat file, you see that same comment here. RefSeq has a frame shift. Um, and that also shows up in our GFF3 format. Uh, also, for, for genes that are represented multiple in multiple locations within the assembly, so for example, this is HLAB, which is uh, on chromosome 6. It is also represented on a series of alternate loci scaffolds. Uh, we typically annotate all of those with the same RefSeq. Uh, so here on the main chromosome, uh, we have this RefSeq transcripted protein. They match the genome perfectly, so they're, they're not highlighted in gray. Uh, and now this location on, on um, an alternate, uh, you can see there's lots of mismatches and indels of this um, alternate haplotype compared to the, the chromosome sequence. And and for example, this transcript now, the comment says it has 65 substitutions compared to, to this haplotype, since this is HLA and there's lots of haplotypic variation. But we're using the same RefSeq to try and provide a, um, a, a reduced set. There are a few genes where we, we do have multiple uh, you know, separate NMs representing different haplotypes, uh, but it's relatively rare. Uh, in terms of uh, other sequences within RefSeq, I won't talk too much about pseudogenes and genomic. RefSeq gene is of interest. Uh, RefSeq gene and the subset of it is, is the LRG project. These are uh, uh, short genomic sequences, typically for just a single gene and some flank that are, are made for clinical reporting standards. Uh, you can use them as, as flat files. Um, or um, another useful way to look at them, again, is, is in a graphical view like this, where you can see um, uh, typically a, a reduced set of transcripts and proteins annotated on the sequence with their exons. Um, and this view, which is available from the gene pages, um, also includes some, some additional tracks that show how this RefSeq gene record aligns to both GRC37 and 38. This example has one mismatch shown down here um, where the RefSeq gene and the transcript actually have, um, have been selected to, to represent a, a sequence that's different from, um, from both versions of the genome. Uh, and just mentioned briefly, we also have a new project of functional, um, annotating functional elements that was started by uh, Catherine Farrell here. 
Um, and what this project is um, is striving to do is to uh, is to annotate uh, regions of, uh, of regulatory features and other features uh, on the genome that have uh, have demonstrated experimental support. So this is the opsin gene, and we're annotating um, a locus control region and a variety of of uh, features upstream of it, uh, uh, which may be uh, useful for for clinical interpretation. Uh, and th this project keeps expanding, and uh, we have some information available for a few thousand genes at this point. Uh, all of that data gets annotated onto the the genome. Um, GRCH 38 P12. Uh, that bundle of the annotated genome plus its transcripts and proteins is, is a data set that we refer to as an annotation release. Uh, we, we periodically re-annotate the genome. Uh, we last annotated in, in late March um, in what we refer to as annotation release 109, um, and that's that's the genome annotation that you see displayed uh, throughout NCBI resources. Uh, we're going to be increasing the frequency at which we, we update the genome annotation uh, starting later this year in order to, to better integrate um, updates um, uh, on a more frequent basis. Uh, our current state of our annotation, just briefly, you know, we're looking at around 20,000 protein coding genes, all of the yeah, all of our uh, various groups working on genome annotation are kind of converging on around this number, and we're in fairly good agreement. Uh, lots of long non-coding RNAs and pseudogenes. Uh, and looking at, uh, at uh, splice variation uh, here, just at looking at coding genes, uh, most, or this is about 43% of genes actually, of coding genes, only have one known uh, RESIC coding transcript at this point. Uh, if you include models, that goes down to about a quarter, uh, and with a large set of uh, sets of genes with, with more um, splice variation represented. Uh, and these numbers could keep, keep increasing, but uh, Really, the most of the, the the highest value annotation is already represented in the, the known set. Uh, for finding data, um, the the best way to find data is actually through uh, our gene resource. And if you query now in, in either for all databases or in a subset of our databases, something like organism plus gene symbol, uh, you will get this. Uh, this knowledge panel pop up with um, kind of the links to to critical useful information, uh, including a, um, a chart of the rest of the transcripts that are available for this gene. Uh, we have a project underway to uh, also identify uh, one one kind of default or select. Um, High value, not necessarily highest value, but uh, a place to start a transcript for each gene that we refer to this project as RefSeq Select. Uh, this is um, also part of a project that we started with um, with the Havana and GenCode groups at Emble EBI that we've now named as Main for matched annotation, uh, where we're working on normalizing a, a subset of RefSeq and ensemble annotation. So that they are synonymous uh, from five prime to three prime in same sequence, and that project is also uh, working to define one common default uh, transcript per gene, uh, kind of an LRG-like uh, uh, data set. Uh, just very quickly going through gene, um, I suspect most of you are, are uh, use gene to one degree or another. Um, Key aspects to be aware of for a gene. Uh, it, one is the magic number here, the gene ID. This is a this is the true uh, uh, unique identifier for this record. Uh, 
symbols aren't necessarily stable, but gene ID, um, um, the integers are largely stable across the data set. Um, we provide nomenclature from H, G, and C. We do um, annotation comparisons versus ensemble, so you can, can see what the equivalent ensemble gene is. I mentioned the summaries. Uh, we had, there's this um, teaser about uh, how this gene is expressed, um, and I'll show more in a second there, um, and, and a link to the mouse ortholog and, and to orthologs available in, at this point, hundreds of other vertebrates. Uh, and also, uh, if you don't actively use this, I would encourage you to pay attention uh, to the table of contents. This is a, the quickest way to navigate around the gene page, uh, since some of these pages are, are quite large. Um, and if you go way down on the right side, there is a feedback section where you can contact us if you have, for example, information about or, questions about particular ref seeks or models or, or any of the information displayed, I encourage you to, to um, contact our, uh, the ref seek help desk. Uh, Gene does have information about uh, locations, not just on the current assembly, but also on 37. Uh, there's also links to browsers here, and Valerie will talk a bit about GDV. Uh, and, uh, Another uh, uh, thing I want to highlight here is within uh, within this genomic regions section, there is uh, you can access not just the uh, the annotation on GRCH 38, but you can look at annotation on the RefC gene or on 37, and this is the best way to get to the view that I showed of the annotation on the RefC gene. The expression data that we have available is uh, is calculated based on a, a set of RNA-seq data that we've processed here, uh, and so the default set that we we show is is this HBA data set spanning like 25 tissues. Uh, data is reported in RPKM, so that's um, reads per. This is a standard. Um, expression measure reads per kilobase per million reads. Uh, uh, one is is probably significant, but low level. Here, this gene is is pretty substantially expressed within um, within the endometrial uterus. Uh, this is an estrogen receptor, uh, and there's some other data sets that you can look at here with more expression data. Uh, there is lots of publication information available from Gene. In this case, um, almost 2,700 publications available for this. This is for BRCA1. Uh, uh, we're interested in, in how people would would like to be able to to sort through that information and and find things of interest. Uh, that's an area of, of uh, active development. Uh, there's interaction data that we import from a variety of sites. Uh, this, this is a way to get to a subset of publication data that may be of interest. We also import data on a daily basis from gene ontology that also has publication information of interest. Uh, and in, I'll highlight in the, the reference sequences section, which has all of the transcripts and proteins. It also has identifiers uh, from other databases, in particular, we do um, annotation comparisons to ensemble, and, and this, this transcript is the best match to, to this RefSeq. It's not necessarily exactly the same thing, um, but it's, um, it's highly similar, and, and this is, eventually this will, for a subset of these, these will be exact matches. Um, for accessing uh, genome-wide data, um, if you do a search for human genome, you can get a knowledge panel that looks like this, um, which points you to some statistics and also links you to the, the assembly page. And you can uh, download FTP files from here. Um, you can also download uh, specific files through the download button here. And we have um, 
variety of files available, annotation in GFF formats, um, uh, FATA and FLAT files available for the protein and RNA sequences that go with the genome. Um, we do have in some other locations, and we're consolidating, working on consolidating this all into uh, being able to easier to find them easier. We have BAM alignments of rest seq transcripts to the genome. Uh, and uh, we do have annotation of GRCH37 available. Um, and uh, there was some interest in gene rifts uh, and how to search them, uh, which uh, could be done by downloading this file. And you could search through with Excel or uh, various means. Uh, uh, and to transition over to talk about uh, 37 versus 38, this is some data uh, uh, in terms of how uh, RESTI transcripts compared to the two genomes. This is a matched data set compared to just the primary assembly of 37 and 38. And, and what this shows is uh, uh, there are still quite a few rep seeks, or as of this date, still quite a few that had uh, some sequence differences versus 38, but it's much less than 37. In particular, uh, there were a substantial number of frame shifts that are present in 37 that have been corrected in 38. Uh, some genes that were partial in 37, uh, and just a few left in 38. Uh, so as motivation to move on to 38. And these numbers will go down as we uh, as we continue to work on the main project. So uh, I went a little over my intended time there. Uh, are there any quick questions that people want to to throw out, or will um, or I'll hand over to Valerie and we can have more questions at the end. I do have a I have a quick question, Terence. Is Matt right? Um, Hi. So I, it's, just, it's about the main um, RepSeq project that you're working on that you mentioned. Uh, I just kind of wanted to know, first of all, will it include all protein coding genes? And the second question I've got on it is, when you're defining the common default transcript, is that going to be based entirely on parameters such as uh, the longest open reading frame, or will you take into account whether it's a known clinically relevant transcript? So we're, we're trying to integrate all of that information. We're, we're distinctly avoiding trying to just look for longest open reading frame, but also favoring um, expression data, conservation data, in, in order to, to pick, make more intelligent picks. Um, and, and we are also factoring clinical information in there. Um, in particular, the, the data set that's already in LRG, uh, we already favor LRG for our picks. Um, so, so that's, we're trying to, Yes, we are trying to integrate all of this. And there will eventually be a, uh, a larger data set that's not just one per gene uh, to, to, to round out the clinical set. So do you, do you have a time frame on, a timeline on when you're hoping to like, have that go live, the RESTI Select? Um, but the RESTI Select, in terms of if you look in the right spot, you can start seeing these now. Um, oh. It's, it's not, so if you do like that search for human BRCA1 and you can see the, the sensor that comes up, the knowledge panel, it says which one is the rest you select. Um, the data, we're, we have it a little bit hidden because we keep, we keep evolving the data set. Um, we're, we're moving towards kind of an alpha release in, in December um, where we'll have done part of the matching um, from five prime to three prime and, and have varying degrees of confidence on uh, which one would we pick as the default. Um, and, and there'll be a larger data, data release um, in April as, uh, as Ensemble's able to, to kind of catch up with um, since Ensemble releases are a, a bit behind us. That sounds fantastic. Thank you. I'll go take a look. Okay. Thank you.